Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good. All right. We are going to take a look at um, Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 17. If you haven't gotten there already, if you want to move to that section. What I'm going to do, if this is okay, I'd like to read through it, all 17 verses, and then what we'll do is we'll go through and we'll, we'll take a look at it um, a little more deeply. So beginning with verse 1, he also said to his disciples, and this is Jesus speaking, there was a certain man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be my steward. Then the steward said to himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I resolve what to do, that when I am out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of the master's debtors to him, and he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said in response, 100 measures of oil. So he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and write 50. And he said to another, how much do you owe me? So he said, 100 measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous righteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into everlasting home. He was faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit you to your trust, to your tr trust the true riches? And if you've not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Now the Pharisees, they were lovers of money, they're in the audience. They're listening. Also heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said to them, You are those who justify yourselves before a man. But God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. And it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. So what do you think? Well, pretty clear, right? <laughs> you read this thing and you kind of scratch your head and you say, okay, Lord Jesus, where are you going with this? I, 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 I'm not sure I get this. Well, let's go through and let's take a look at it verse by verse. Okay, let's look at verse one. He also said to his disciples, a certain rich man, who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting goods. So, who are the key characters that he's speaking of? Manager, right? Or the owner, the rich owner, and the steward, or the manager. Okay, now there's also a third party who's not really mentioned by name, but referenced, because the third party brought information to the master. So what were the roles? The owner likely owned a very large piece of land, which is very common at this time for the wealthy, the very wealthy. They own a lot of land. They use a portion of it for themselves and their families, but they'd also use a portion for rental properties. Managers at this time typically have one of two roles. They either manage the household and the staff, or else they manage the financial aspects of the manager or the owner. 
and uh, in this case, it would be the property and the tenants. And the third party was someone who shared the concern with the owner. And the thing to keep in mind, at this time, yes, he rented out to different people, but it wasn't like today where, okay, we've got an owner. I never even talked to the owner. I just send my check. He knew the people in his community. He oftentimes had close relationships with people in his community. So the question is, was it neglect or was it dishonesty? So let's go to verse 2. So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. The owner's response, he refers to what he heard. Somebody came and reported something's not right. But he asked for an explanation. So there's two possible tenant arrangements. Um, sometimes there were situations where the tenant would pay a monthly fee, predetermined. It would come in each month. This is unlikely because if that were the case, then the owner would have noticed the discretions in the income all along. There's a second scenario, which was also common at this time, and that's where tenants paid a portion of their monthly production. So they may be producing produce, crops, oil, cattle, could be a number of things, but they would give a portion of that to the owner. And if it was very productive, the owner got a lot. If it was not as productive, it got a little less, but that's the way it worked. Now, that was apparently the case here because if the income varies, it makes sense that the owner wouldn't have caught it right away. He asked him to give an account. It was an opportunity to explain. Was it a misunderstanding? The owner stated his likely release. So the owner was pretty sure he's getting the boot. And the manager, he had a chance to explain. The owner is honest, showing his grace, giving him a chance to explain. And you've got to wonder, I mean, how much did he really know? Did he know a lot? And the manager's sort of squirming, saying, well, how do I respond? The manager doesn't know how much the owner knows because he hasn't stated. He said, you're mismanaging my goods. So if he states too much, he's going to give away more than he wants to give away because he's dishonest and he wants to hide it. If he gives away too little, the manager is going to say, hey, you're lying. So what's he do? He stays silent. He doesn't even respond. So what's at stake for the manager? His job, his livelihood, his reputation. Given the responsibility and the revenue, the owner needs a replacement plan. Okay. You got to understand, this was a major role that this manager had. He was managing the owner's all this um, produce, oil, goods, coming in, turning it into currency, trading it for other things. He had a big job. And consequently, it wasn't something where you're fired, okay, who's going to fill this spot? So he's a little slow in replacing him. So let's go to verses 3 and 4. And the steward said with him, <coughs> within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I resolve what to do, that when I am out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So where's the manager's focus? Is it on the owner or himself? Yeah, darn right. That's all he cares about. He's, he's, he's all about himself. And the solution, and he's already proven himself a conniver, right? So you know where he's going. He's going to use others to fix his problems, and he's going to do it without remorse. Let's go to verses 5 through 7. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write 50. 
And he said to another, how much do you owe? So he said, 100 measures of wheat. So he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So the manager's response was until he was going to be released, he has room to maneuver. Tenants are likely unaware of this whole situation. They just think, wow, this is gracious. Thank you so much. Probably thankful to the owner, thankful to the manager. And the manager uses the master's property earnings to win favor of others. Totally self-focused. He called on everyone. He wouldn't take any chances. He's going to every single tenant and doing this deal where he's knocking their what they owe down. <clears throat> and he's thinking, perhaps there's a future job working for them. Perhaps they'll take me in, give me housing. He's looking out for himself. So let's look at verse 8. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt truly. Makes perfect sense, right? You read this and you say, say what? Why would you commend him? I don't think what we're talking about here is a compliment. He's simply acknowledging, man, you are shrewd. You know, you cheated me before, and now you've cheated me again. He recognized his craftiness, but again, he showed grace. One of the things he could have done that he did not do, he could have had the manager arrested, carried off and thrown in jail. But he didn't do that. This owner was an owner full of grace. So the master unlikely reversed the discounts because the tenants, they didn't know what was going on, and they were appreciative. He doesn't want to upset the tenants. So he probably let that go. And the manager's still about to be released. So what's our personal reaction to all this? Probably, what does this have to do with me? I've never stolen anything. <laughs> but there is a message in this for us. You gotta look at the context of what Jesus was talking about this time. Jesus had just finished talking about the prodigal son in the previous parable. And what was the message about the prodigal son? It was a son of a wealthy man. He went out, took his inheritance, wasted it, had a ball, went crazy, and then he wasted it until it was all gone. Then he came back in repentance. Here you have someone else who's wasting something that wasn't really his and had been given to him, uh, trust entrusted to him. And, uh, but here, there's no remorse. Let's go to verse 8. Um, For the sons of the world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. The people who are chasing worldly goods can be very focused. They are going to do what they can to move up in the ranks, to get the best salary they can, to purchase all the things they can, get the big house, everything they can to bring pleasure and attention to themselves. But God has a different perspective. Do we, as children of God, have a master and an owner of all things? The Lord God. The Lord God is our master. Do we recognize that in our day-to-day -day moments, our day-to-day -day thoughts? The Lord, Father, Son, Holy Spirit is the Lord of all. And what has God entrusted us to manage? How well do we use these gifts to love and to serve others? What impact has our heart and actions had on those around us? You think about it, I mean, we are in contact with others all the time. Family, if we're working, our coworkers, 
our neighbors, our friends, what impact are we having on them? Verses 9 to 10. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. So we've got to look at what are the gifts that God has given us? He's given us worldly gifts. Uh, He's given us skills and abilities. He's given us social skills. Some of us are really good at dealing with other people. He's given us communication skills. Some of us are great at communicating. He's given us relationships, close connections with family members, with friends, with coworkers. He's given us career skills. Are we using each of these things to serve God and serve others? Or are we using them to serve ourselves? And that's the question we have to ask ourselves. We are imperfect people. We're not going to do it perfectly. But we need to ask ourselves and think about it. Where is our focus? Is our focus on self and worldly desires? God has also given us true riches. Now, and I should explain when he talks about worldly mammoth, what do you think that is? Or unrighteous mammoth? It's worldly things. Yeah, it's money, worldly things. It calls it unrighteous because so often it's unrighteousness that drives us as we chase after it. So if we can't be counted on to use the worldly things and trusted, how can we be trusted with the spiritual riches? And that's where he goes 11, 12. Therefore, if you're not faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust in true riches? And if you've been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? True riches. What are the true riches? God's grace. Do we show grace for others? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Are we seeking God, looking for his direction? A heart of love. How well do we love those around us? The truth about God's word. Are we in God's word, looking for truth so we can understand what is God all about? Who are we? What's our purpose in this life? The salvation message. Do we share that or do we pull back? Well, I don't want to offend anybody. Do we boldly show our faith? Prayer. Prayer is a wonderful thing. When I grew up, I was taught these prayers that you learned and you rehearsed and you repeated them. And there were some beautiful prayers. But the thing I didn't realize, the prayer worked just talking to God, just like we talk to each other. Do we talk with God regularly? Do we compartmentalize it? Okay, this is, Lord, this is your time between 7 and 7.30. I'm going to read my Bible and pray. Or do we bring them into our everyday moments? Do we talk to them? Thank you, Lord. Lord, help me here. Lord, what can I do for this person? Spiritual gifts, spiritual discernment, service, teaching, helps, exhortation, and others. Do we use these gifts that God has given, these special gifts that God has given to accomplish his works? Are we using them to serve him and to serve others? Are we torn between the world and our Lord, our our one and only true Savior? Verse 13, no one can serve two masters for either. He'll hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon, or God and money, or the world. 
The manager faced his decision. And where did he turn? Did he turn to God? He turned, turned this way, right? It was all about himself. And we see a lot of that in the world today. There's a lot of problems in the world, and it all relates to pride and selfishness. But we can make a difference. Where is our focus? We cannot serve both. So from there, Jesus jumped to the Pharisees. Pharisees really liked Jesus, didn't they? <laughs> oh, my goodness. And he was so patient with them, but he was direct. Uh, so in verses 14 to 15, now the Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts, for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Now, these were highly respected religious leaders, gone through tons and tons of training. It took them a while to rise up to that level of Pharisee. Very proud of the fact that they were Pharisees. So let's look at some of the other verses in the Bible that talk about the Pharisees. Matthew 6, 2, it says, Therefore, and he's speaking to the Pharisees, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, that they may have glory for men. Or Matthew 6, 5, and when you pray, you should not be like the hypocrites, for when they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Oh, Lord. Everybody watching? Hey, Lord. <laughs> That's not, what, that's not what our prayer and, and our praise is all about. Verses 616, moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance on their face, for they disfigure their faces that they may be to be men who are fasting. Surely I say to you, they have the reward. They're not fasting for God. They're fasting to draw the attention of men. And in Matthew 23, 5 through 7, but all their works they do to be seen by men. They make the phylacteries. Phylacteries were a box that they had on their front, and it was tied to their belt, and they would have key verses in there. And that was a sign that they were Pharisees. Well, Pharisees all carried these phylacteries. But what they would do is they'd make the boxes bigger and bigger, and bigger because they wanted to be noticed. <clears throat> they love the best places at feast, the best seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called by men, Rabbi, oh Rabbi. Where's the praise? The praise for God or is it for the Rabbi? God's view of the law. Let's look at uh, verses 16, 17. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. And it's easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one tittle of the law to fail. Pharisees often criticized Jesus, saying that he did not follow the Mosaic law. They were constantly accusing of things he wasn't guilty of. Now, in pride, you've got to keep in mind the Pharisees not only had the Mosaic law, but they had the Pharisee law. They kept adding laws on top of laws on top of laws. The system had become so legalistic that following them was more about following all the little steps in the laws than it was about a dedicated love for the Lord. God shared his truth and his love through the Old Testament, the Mosaic law. And the prophets, through the prophets. He did this to guide his people in actions and worship. And he wanted to lead them to a godly environment of faithfulness, godly submission, and spiritual growth. To point to our sinful nature, in Romans 3.20 says, Therefore the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his 
in his sight. For the by the law, his knowledge is sin. What the law also does is it points out our sinfulness. We go through the laws, we can recognize pretty quickly we all fall short. All of us. No exceptions. We're saved by faith. Many still believe that our salvation is based on performance. I can remember when I went out and I was knocking on doors and sharing the gospel. I would ask people, you know, if you were to die tonight, do you, do you believe that you are going to heaven? And a common response that I got was, well, I'm a pretty good person. But it's not how we are compared to the person next to us. How are we compared to God? It's not about performance. How many times we go to church? How many times we go to communion? How many times we give financial support? All are good. But it's not about the report card. Okay. Let me see the bad deeds, good deeds, good deeds. Yeah, it's, I can see a slight edge for the good deeds. You know, you're okay. We're all sinners and we need God's grace. Romans 3.23, for all sin falls short of the glory of God. It's only by God's grace and the sacrifice of Jesus that we're saved. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for grace you have been saved through faith. It's a gift. It's a wonderful gift. It's the best gift man has ever received from God. It's not from yourselves. It's a gift of God, not a works, lest anyone should boast. John 3, 16, that we all know so well, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our sins from the past, current, and future are wiped out, taken away. What a great gift. What a great gift. In Galatians, because you are, Galatians 4, 6, and 7, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, therefore you're no longer a slave, but a son or a daughter. You are a child of God, and you're an heir of God through Christ. I mention these because if there's anybody here who has never given their heart to our Lord Jesus Christ, I beg you, I beg you, may today be the day. It's a matter of saying, Lord Jesus, I need you. I've tried doing it my way. Lord, I need you. And I give my heart to you this day. So if that's you, don't let another day pass. Please, today, give your heart. The Lord loves you with all his heart. And he wants that relationship with you. He's standing at the door knocking, but you have to let him in. So what's the calling for God's children? Jesus one time was asked, teacher, which is by the Pharisees, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, this is the first and great commandment. And the second's like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands hang all the laws and the prophets. We are to love the Lord our God and serve him following Jesus' example. We're to love and serve others as God has loved us. We are gifted by God with both earthly and spiritual gifts. They're there so that we can focus on God and serving others. How do we get focus? The Word of God helps us understand who He is, who we are, what God's purpose for our life is. And God speaks to us directly through his word. If you've been studying the gospel, it amazes me. I'll read a passage again and again and again, and sometimes I'll be going through something, and I'll read it, and all of a sudden, bang, it hits me in a whole new way. 
It constantly speaks to you. And prayer. Prayer is a normal conversation. Just like we have conversations with each other. Share your heart with the Lord. Tell him what's going on. Not that he doesn't know. He does. But the fact that you want to share that with him, he appreciates that. Seek him. Seek his direction. Thank him. Praise him. And do it throughout the day. And serving others. Do we love them as God loves us? Are we caring for their needs? Are physical, emotional, spiritual? Are we being open and bold about our faith? It's not about winning their approval or praise. It's all about love. And that's what we need to remember. As God loved us, may we love others. Fully embracing God's love for us. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Talking about Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, was Jesus. So He was there with the Father at creation. He helped create us. Psalm 139, 1, 2. O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down. And when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. He said to Jeremiah, the prophet, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I concentrated or consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. He knew us before we were born. He knows our every thought, our every action, our every word, and he loves us with all his heart. So if you think about that, what does that mean in terms of the creation? It means that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, they knew about our rebellion before we were even created. So what did they do about it? They still created us. I wonder, since they, God knows everything about us before we're born, as they were making that decision to create, knowing that Jesus would have to come to the earth as a man, live, be ridiculed, be beaten, and ultimately nailed to a wooden cross, spikes in his hands and his feet, and eventually suffocating as he hung and couldn't push himself up to breathe, dying on a cross. Jesus knew he was going to have to do that. That was the Father's plan for him. So you think about it. What was that like? For Jesus. What was it like for the father? As a father or a mother, could you do that for your child? Would you be willing to give up your child to do that? That's a hard thought. But God loved us that much. Jesus loved us that much. And they were prepared to do it all. And I wonder if, as they were beginning to create, knowing what was coming, we tend to think of them thinking of us collectively. I want to bring my children home to me. Were they thinking generally or were they thinking specifically about us? They knew us already. They loved each one of us already. Yet, they went and made the incredible sacrifice, the painful sacrifice, because they love us that much. So as we serve, we need to remember, it's not to earn his love and grace that's already been given. It's not for recognition of others. Oh, you're such a good person. 
And even the heavenly rewards, which are such a rich blessing, we don't do good things looking to see what we're going to get in return. We do it for one reason, the thing that God has called us to. God wants us to simply love him back. Love him with all our hearts, just as he has loved us. I would um, ask that if there's anybody here that has been, been touched by God's word here and feels, Lord, I need to refocus, pray about that. Please pray about that. Allow God's Holy Spirit to lead you. And if you have not received our Lord Jesus as your Savior yet, after we do our final worship, I would encourage you to come up. There's going to be prayer partners up front and come and pray with them. It's the most decision, important decision you will ever make in your life. So I thank you, and may God be praised.